<laughs> Hi. Hello, welcome everybody. Oh my gosh, so many smiling faces. So happy to see you all here. So happy to have Mari here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just wanted to shout out again that this is being recorded and broadcast. Um, we have uh, a picture of Mari's book here. Um, we're also going to display some of Mari's work from this book. We've selected some pieces. Um, so I'm gonna be verbally describing those, which uh, should be a fun adventure. Um, <laughs> also, uh, just wanted to note that I think one of the reasons we're all here is that we love Mari's vulnerability. Um, in a little moment of vulnerability of my own, um, I have a bit of a stutter on words that start with vowels. So bear with me, we're gonna get through it together. Um, so, yeah, I am so excited to be here talking to you. Thank and you. I think, like, we're here to talk about the book, which is an amazing book. I just read it, I cried, I laughed. It was really <laughs> incredible. Um, we all love your work. I think you, you, like, do some really amazing conversation about art and healing and finding yourself. Um, and you tell a lot of really great stories about your life as well. And so I wanted to cover sort of those, those three topics today. Cool. Um, and one thing that I was really struck by in your book and also your work in general is you have this, this deep kind of reverence for this ordinary magic that you see like all around you. And that's actually a phrase that you use in the book that I really like. And so um, I would love to like just sort of start by hearing a little bit about you and some of the sort of ordinary magical things that you love. Yeah, <laughs> so funny. <laughs> yeah, well, I've been keeping a journal since I could write. My poor mom has like a closet stacked with journals, <laughs> just like every thought I've ever had in my life. And the cool thing about looking back on them is like, I cannot tell you a single thing about the job I had when I was 25 at this <laughs> random nonprofit, but I can tell you everything <laughs> about the flowers on the way to that job. Like the, <laughs> my walking commute, I've written it all down. I tell you about like the strangers I saw on the way, the girl on the subway, whatever. Like I think that because I was such a journaler and always recording the things that happened to me, I can really see that it was the small moments that really, really stood out during those times. Like, that's what I chose to record. And I love when I read, like, old-timey journals of people long ago, how they would talk about, you know, like, their wallpaper and their dinner and that kind of thing. And maybe you didn't know the big achievements that they had or the big accomplishments, but you knew what they ate for breakfast. And that is really sometimes the stuff that you remember the most. So I think that was apparent to me pretty early on that I am gonna remember these small moments. And, um, and that's certainly what I've remembered over time. And that continues to be the most important part of my life. Yeah, that's so nice. I, so when did you start journaling? What, what was it that uh, led you to journaling? Like five, I don't know, just like, <laughs> My little thoughts, I've always been a big letter writer. I've always, um, I used to write letters to my mom every morning um, <laughs> before she left for work. Aww. Just like, you know, about my day. And I think that's kind of when I started like drawing my little life, like little, my life in little cartoons. So yeah, I mean, since I could hold a pencil essentially. Yeah, ah, oh, that's so nice. Did like, have you ever like returned to that material? Like, over I the try not to. It's no. not like a pleasant <laughs> experience for uh -huh. me. <laughs> it's pretty cringy. Yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, I can imagine. That's funny. Um, so, so one thing that I really um, was struck by in your book is you have a lot of stories about travel mm -hmm. and you have a lot of stories about your home and all of the different places you've lived and the places yeah. that you've made home. And there's something really beautiful about the way that you seek to kind of create rituals around um, like your home and your life and the places that you live. Uh, and what are some of the um, rituals and the places that have become most important to you? Oh, yeah, I am. Um, whenever I move somewhere, I do really try to create those rituals immediately because for me, that is the way that I feel at home somewhere. 
Um, even especially when I'm traveling. Uh, when, I, when I live in a place, I always try to shake things up, try to explore new places, try to make it feel like I'm traveling in the city where I'm living. But when I'm abroad, I love to feel like I belong at a coffee shop. So I try to go there every day and then I'm like, Ah, oh, I had the best time living in Berlin for five days. So nice, really miss it. Um, so I try to create those, but now, I mean, nowadays my drawing really is a, a lovely daily ritual for me. It's the most relaxing part of my day. Something that I find very funny is that I'm a full-time illustrator and I spend five minutes a day actually drawing. <laughs> like it's so much other, you know, stuff, but um, that is something that still is like, my really sacred time of day. And I think when you have those rituals, it becomes like holy for you. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's so nice. I, so, so how, what was it that led you to create that ritual of art specifically? Because this whole project started with like a daily yeah. post kind of system, right? Yeah, oh my gosh, yeah. Well, I was depressed. I, um, I was grieving. <laughs> Grieving the loss of my father in a significant relationship, dealing with some health issues, like very circumstantial depression. And um, depression for me, in the times that I've had it, manifests itself as a lack of curiosity. It's like a lack of desire, it's a lack of wanting anything. And I knew that I had to spark curiosity in myself. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that I had to keep that flame going or I would crumble and die. I mean, that's what depression does to you. It's really oppressive. And um, so I decided to do a lot of things that I had never done before, like pick up a guitar and learn how to play. I mean, learn is a very strong word, but um, you know, like try, you know, fiddle around and take salsa lessons and learn Portuguese and do all these things that had no um, goal. There was no outcome. When I started that Instagram account, I mean, I kept it private. It was like nothing, it was just, it's just I like to draw, so I wanted to do it every day and kind of learn how to draw better just by doing it, because that's how I've always done it. It's just, you know, by routine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was, I mean, there was really no end goal, but it was to spark a curiosity in myself and to put a little joy on the calendar every day, and it still is that joy for me. I mean, whenever I'm in a really uh, bleak place, that is the little light at the end of the day when you know, pour myself a beverage and have that time. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah, yeah, that is really nice. So, so you mentioned just then that, that you were looking for sort of sparks. Yeah. Um, and what was it like for you when, when that spark kind of caught and turned into something bigger? It was nuts. It was absolutely nuts. I mean, even to get, I remember one post got 100 likes. And I was like, what? Did I just go viral? Like, what <laughs> happened? And it's weird because I, I mean, I, I'm such a, like, Enneagram 4. I think that I'm the only person who's, like, ever experienced my feelings before. And I also felt weird. Like, I, I was a weird kid. I didn't have really a lot of friends until college. Um, I've always felt a little different from people. I don't think I'm, I still don't think I'm relatable. I think that I'm honest, you know, and when someone's honest, people tend to relate. But I didn't think that I had a life that a lot of people could relate to. And it was, and I felt like sometimes I kind of push my limits and see the more specific I get, what is the response gonna be? And the response was greater because I think with specifics, you, you feel the emotion behind that. And we all have the same emotions. I mean, it's kind of crazy. It actually makes me like think the world is a scam because yeah. we're like, we all have the exact same, <laughs> we're all the same person. Like, <laughs> like, are we just like repeating each other's mistakes and triumphs over and over? I think so. So that was really, I mean, it was interesting on a personal level because I didn't feel like I had that much that people could relate to, but I also, it was also interesting on an anthropological level, like, huh, all right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> We're absolutely. all the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so cool. So, so how did that, like, you started with this, this process of, um, of having these daily posts and, and you mentioned like, like trying to get more specific, like how did your approach to your art making change over time? 
I think, well, when it started, it was really just an exercise in drawing. I mean, yeah. if you look at like the earliest posts, it's like a picture of a leaf or a pumpkin, whatever, like whatever I was wanting to draw that day. And then because I am, I identify as a writer, I've been a writer forever, I think it became kind of an extension of writing for me, especially during uh, my bout with depression. It was really hard for me to sit down and write an entire essay. And that was very disturbing because that's always the way that I express myself. And that always became that always came very naturally to me. And it was weird to not really be able to do that, just not have the energy or the interest, or like I just didn't have it anymore. I kind of lost it. And so it was when I was making these immediate drawings, it was almost like an entire essay in one little cartoon, like I could explain something without having to write all of it, which would have taken mm -hmm. so much energy that I just didn't have. Yeah. And I could just do a little dialogue and that's kind of what I would have written, you know, a couple of pages about. Um, so it became a little more like, you know, over time, less, less, um, you know, just observational of things and more observational of my emotions and experiences. And then over time, I got in a pretty like happy place and didn't have that much to write about anymore. So then I started drawing <laughs> on memories yeah. from, you know, 10 years of different jobs and heartache and grief and uh, all of these things I had been through. And so I, I started realizing, wow, I actually have like, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I didn't start this when I was 20 because I wouldn't have had that much to say. <laughs> now I have like so many years of ridiculous experiences to write about. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, so to build on that, actually, that's that's sort of a nice segue um, into one of the first uh, pieces that that we've picked out here. So, um, for the folks listening at home or sitting at the back there. Um, <laughs> This piece is titled Searching for Yourself versus Creating Yourself. And there's two columns of pictures here. And we can see experimenting with a haircut versus making your haircut the best it can be and learning things like your hair dryer and your hairbrush, which I'm learning about and it's, it's hard, it's hard. <laughs> um, Exploring places to live, and we can see many different doors, versus making a place your home. And we see one door, but there's a welcome sign and a little pot of flowers. Trying on trends, we can see an assortment of skirts and shorts, versus wearing what makes you feel powerful, bouncy, fun, cute, elegant, however you want to feel. There's the stutter. Uh, and there's a, a very loud patterned uh, romper there. Um, taking note of passions and abilities, and there's a list of possible careers like poet, journalist, gown designer, um, versus diving in and doing your best. And we see a little laptop with a cup of pens and pencils. So you talked a lot about um, how you really like came to value when you were drawing on those experiences, like having that huge diversity of having done so many things. And, and you write a lot about, you know, the, the many and difficult jobs that you've had um, and that search for purpose. Yeah. Um, and I, th like, that's something that I personally struggle with. I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with, but yeah. like, how did you come to you really just like embrace that, process of discovery and kind of finding? It was really hard. I mean, embrace is something I've only really done recently with that. Um, first, as a millennial, I, I think that we are taught that there's this one, you're supposed to just follow your passion. Find your passion, follow your passion. I know so few people who have like one passion. <laughs> And they tend to be like kind of boring because they've just like <laughs> done this one thing their entire life. I would not call illustration my passion. You know, it's something I like to do. Yeah. I don't know what my passion is. Maybe I'll find it someday. I'll let you know. But um, I think there was this, this idea that I was taught somewhere from media, society, whatever, that like you have to like hustle and like go toward this one thing and you know like sacrifice so much for this one thing but I was like I don't know what that is and so there was that and then um you know there was also 
like I lived in DC for a few years. That is a city that is all about your career. And that is the time I was the most lost in my life. I had no idea what I was doing. I thought, I came there thinking I was gonna like work at nonprofits, be kind of like a lobbyist or something. And then I got sidetracked by um, men's fashion, which I was really into, <laughs> and that's two years of my life, I'm never getting back. And um, I was like a hot mess. And every time I went to parties and people would ask me, what do you do? I would have like, a, I would get so panicky. And I would start saying, I'm a writer. And they'd be like, what have you written? And I'd say, <laughs> nothing. Like, I, letters, <laughs> I don't know. It was, that was a really challenging time. And it wasn't until I started creating. And like the definition of creation is like making something from nothing. So I had like kind of nothing. <laughs> but I think of it sort of as composting. I've been thinking a lot about composting because I'm on the West Coast, <laughs> which is so good with the environment. We're so like behind on the East, but um, use your scraps. You know, like I had all of these like apple cores of jobs to use that had like no purpose and relationships too. Like in cities I had lived in randomly, like what was I doing in Baltimore? I cannot tell you a single thing I did there. <laughs> but that, you know, like I, I took that and I used it creatively. And I think that's kind of like, if you are a creative person, that's what you have to do with these times where you're like, what the hell was that? Yeah. You know, you, um, I mean, yeah, use the, use the lettuce or whatever of like the thing that you didn't eat. Be like, okay, now it's mulch. I don't know. Right, yeah. <laughs> I have a lot to learn about composting. You've got the basics. Okay, so, yeah. great. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, so, so um, I, I think like you sort of danced around it there a little bit, but th like there's, there's, there's this concept that, that you have it like in your book and in several of your pieces that I really like, which is, um, uh, sort of like making space for these like, like lives that you could have led or lives mm -hmm. that you did lead that you no longer lead. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, there's, there's actually another one. It's just perfect. We're having like the best oh. conversation. <laughs> I, yeah. Um, so uh, this piece is titled alternate lives. Um, and we see six uh, portraits of Mari here. I'm, I'm yes, yes? Okay. <laughs> that was me, <laughs> my imagination. And uh, the first is captioned dance teacher in Rhode Island. And you're wearing a little scarf. You have sort of hair pulled back and some dance teacher glasses. <laughs> the next is titled plant-based yoga teacher in San Francisco. <laughs> a very common specimen you see on the street. <laughs> Um, and you've got long flowing hair and a pendant necklace. Um, the third is married to third boyfriend and living in the Chicago suburbs. We see a short little bouncy bob, um, a pearl necklace maybe, some nice round glasses. Um, designer in Montreal, designers in quotes here, um, but you have the designer glasses and a red turtleneck. Um, fashion writer in New York um, and lawyer, a real thing I considered. <laughs> so, which, which, like, when did you start to, um, and maybe this was a more gradual thing, but, but when, when did you start to sort of like take this perspective that, that this is something that you can just let go of? Oh, that was also pretty recent. <laughs> I've had a really, I've clung to these, I mean, these are real. I. I've clung to them and sometimes I'll get so like obsessed with one of them it's hard to let it go. I San Francisco was honestly the biggest one like that was really really hard to let go of and still is. I mean I was out gallivanting today by the sea and I was like oh this is paradise why don't I live here and I think what you have to realize I mean I I had reasons for making the choices I did at the time and um I think something that's so good to remember, especially as I'm, I'm getting older, I'm thinking about like family and stuff like that. And I don't have to have every life experience, you know, like no one does, no one can. I can only have the one that I have. Yeah. And if I'm able to, 
like visit here, that's incredible. I've won the lottery, like that's amazing. Um, but it is really hard to let those, uh, Cheryl Strayed said, like sister light, sister ships, like, you know, you see this ship passing and you wave hi to it because it's mm -hmm. a life that you could have had. But you don't know, you don't know if you're gonna be like, you know, in a really bad job there or in a toxic relationship or, you know, um, being priced out, <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. And um, you can only do the best with what you have and the information you have at the time. And again, like using what you have gained in your life as uh, a lesson or something that brings you closer to yourself, that's all you can really do. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and and in terms of like that, that moment when, when you sort of realized looking back that this was something that you could use to kind of fuel your art and give new life both to those experiences and towards your artistic journey. Um, I, I think th th there's, there's something nice in the book about how it seems like a lot of uh, sort of decisions that I personally would stress a lot about, like big life decisions, um, you took a very sort of like practical mindset towards like, this is something I'm gonna try and if it doesn't work out, that's <laughs> fine. Um, but that moment when when you, you sort of like stepped more heavily into this art making process mm -hmm. and your career as an artist and a writer now, um, what was it like to, to, to like take those first steps towards like claiming that life? and shaping that life? Hmm. I feel like I'm still in that process. Um, I think it took a while. I mean, I, I, I think it was fortunate. I was a little older when I started. I was 28 when I started drawing. And um, I think because I'd had that life experience, I didn't have time to worry about, like, am I a real artist? Mm -hmm. I didn't have time. Like, I, I didn't have the energy to stress about that. If there's one thing I can communicate with what I'm doing, it's you can do this too. Like, there is no line between artist and non-artist except like someone who makes art. <laughs> like there's not, I didn't go to art school. I didn't know a thing about illustration or cartooning before I started. I'm so grateful that I have learned about it, but Coming into that was, I think I had at that point the perspective of, I, especially because I was dealing with grief, which manifested for me like, I don't, I just don't, like my time is running out. I, I've got to do what I want to do and I've got to make the things I want to make and I've got to say the things I want to say and I don't have time to be insecure about that. Yeah. So um, stepping into that role was more just like survival. It was like I, would honestly rather die than not express what I have to express or tell this story. And so that said, I, I cannot be worrying about like what people think about it or if people don't think I'm like legit enough or like I don't like I don't know how to scam <laughs> things. Like I, I don't know. I just gotta do it. I just yeah, gotta make yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you talk a lot about um, like that, that process of healing, both mm -hmm. from physical hurts and from emotional hurts. Yeah. Um, and um, specifically in the book, um, there you um, talk a lot about the act of like preparing to heal also. Um, and, and, and what was that uh, like healing process like? Like what were some of the sort of like significant moments of healing that you experienced? Yeah, healing, I mean, I was thinking to, I'm healing from a heartache right now, which in the grand scheme of things, I mean, I've had like 950,000 like breakups. It's not really that uncommon for me, but it's still, it, like it always feels like the first time, not only the first time it's happened to me, but like the first time it's happened to anyone. Like, yeah. have you guys felt this before? This is crazy. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a small thing. I mean, I, I've also healed from a, a deadly disease and I've healed from grief. Those are, you know, I guess kind of objectively harder things to get through, but for me, they sort of follow a same pattern, which is going into possibility again. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are so harmed, like for me being sick, I lost so much innocence 
with my body. Like I just felt like I couldn't trust my body anymore. I still feel that way. I felt like in a lot of ways I couldn't trust the world again. Um, I have experienced trauma before and that's, you know, that is like, it makes the world feel so empty and it makes the world feel like a scary place. Yeah. And like, it's hard to trust anyone. And, um, you know, healing from grief is like healing. It's the craziest, like cyclical, strange, it follows no pattern at all. It's just like loops and it's, um, and sometimes it's like two steps forward, one step, or rather a few steps back. But I think, again, like the common thread is just coming into, can I be possible again? Can I, can again? Can I um, want things again? Can the world be a place of potential rather than like fear for me? And for me, the, the best way to kind of uh, manifest that in my life is um, through trying new things because it makes it feel like, wow, I didn't know that this part of me existed. And if I don't know that this part of me existed, what do I not know about the world? You know, what, what wonders does the world have for me? Yeah. And so, especially like physical healing, there were so many things I couldn't do anymore. Like I literally couldn't write or draw, but I started learning about wine because I could like hold a wine glass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I wouldn't like recommend this for like physical <laughs> healing, but whatever, I was in Spain and, um, <laughs> And it was like something I could learn about. Yeah. And I always thought, oh, I'm like, my palate is so dumb. Like, I'll never know about this thing. And then I became kind of an expert at it just because I had to. And it opened up a part of myself that I didn't really know existed. And now I can order the wine for the table. So <laughs> thank you, autoimmune disease, for giving me that confidence. Yeah, yeah. That's... <laughs> That's a superpower, yeah, basically. Absolutely. That's, yeah, <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, what's the second cheapest? Right. In, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's a good trick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump forward a little bit just because there's one that I think is very apropos. Cool. Um, so, yeah. So, so, so here is um, a drawing of a little piggy bank, and it's labeled the Future You Bank. Um, and there are a series of coins that could be dropped into it. Um, one says Pilates, one says Banjo Tutor, one says Surf School, um, and one says Portuguese Classes. Uh, and it's captioned, I recommend setting up automatic monthly deposits. So um, you mentioned this a little bit, but what, what are some of the coins that you are most glad to have in the future you bank? Oh, um... I think the biggest one was rel reliance on my own way of making myself happy. So reliance on my own happiness. Like I said, you know, like when I was working at this place in DC that I can't even remember the name of, I do remember the commute because I walked there and back every day. It took an hour each way, but that was sometimes the happiest part of my week, you know, and I relied on that to make me happy. And I think such a good use of time, like if you're in a job you don't really like, or if you're in a city you don't really like, or whatever, like finding a way to put a bit of fun or joy into your day is the best use of your time and relying on, on that. I still do with drawings, like I've, I can get really, really down um, about the internet stuff and uh, the feedback I get. But drawing is still the thing that lifts me up, you know? Yeah. It's like that kind of interesting balance. Um, although I think in my 20s it was so much about activities and skills and observations. And now I'm finding it so beautiful and meaningful to really invest in friendships. And I think that I sort of... I've always been a bit of a loner, so it always felt like, oh, I just need to make myself happy. But one thing I'm so proud of this year is that I have such good friends, and they've been so Aww. supportive of me in this journey, which has been really hard. And um, I think, you know, like investing in those people and just asking about their days and going to their like weird performance art <laughs> thing, <laughs> like it really makes a difference, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. Thank you to my coworkers who are here. And, and <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is very special. That's 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 a very important thing. Um so so to to turn the conversation a little bit towards like the making of this incredible book, um, which I, I hope you all have the opportunity to go um, see for yourself and maybe purchase in the lobby later. Um, <laughs> but uh, w like you're such a prolific artist. I mean, when when I first found you, I, I just kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and I was like, oh my gosh, where it did never like, ends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How many feelings does she have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I. What was that that process like of of creating this book? How did you decide what to put in it? I've been writing this book for seven years. I mean, I wrote the first essay uh, seven years ago, and I've always wanted to write a book. Again, I've always been a writer. It was um, my my lovely friends would always tell me when I was at these bullshit jobs, like. Um, this is just going to be fuel for your book someday, <laughs> you know. And I always thought I would. Uh, I would write a book when I was like 70. But when my dad died and I was so fueled by stories of other people, I thought I have to tell this story. Because to me, I, stories were my life raft. And it was um, so important for me. I thought, I, I just kept thinking like, thank God these artists and writers shared you know, their experience of grief, even if it was like, self-indulgent, even if it was really hard to get out there, because I need this. And um, concurrently, I was starting the illustration thing. So the two sort of worked hand in hand. I've always really loved visual books, so it was really nice for me to, and I, I never envisioned it as an illustrated book, which is sort of funny, because that's like, exactly what it is, but, um, but I think the two worked really well together, and then I was able to incorporate more stories that sort of like didn't quite have a home, but they were this, you know, narrative of growing up and growing into myself and finding myself not despite, but, um, you know, because of a lot of the, the um, sidetracks. The loop-de-loop -loop zigzags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really cool. So, so, like, what was the most challenging part of creating this book? Because I, I always feel like whenever I finish even a small project at work, I'm like, I need a vacation. I need yes. to, like, if, if, <laughs> yes. if I, and I can only, I, I, like, the process of sort of, like, giving life to this book mm. that's been in your head, I can imagine that there was also a lot of challenge in that. For sure. Yeah, I did feel, I mean, I've never been pregnant before. I don't want to be like rude to, <laughs> but like, I kind of felt like I was having a baby. I felt like it was like, oh my gosh, just like get it out of me. I'm so, so <laughs> done with having all of this inside of me. But um, I think because I, a lot of creative people are sort of creative gluttons. Like we want to do everything. And something that was hard as I was writing is just like, oh, like shiny thing over there. I'm going to start doing that. Mm -hmm. And I wish, um, you know, just for my own sort of <laughs> sanity or clarity of mind, I'd like really focused on this one thing, but there were too many fun things. It was right when I was kind of coming into my new career and I just wanted to draw everything and I was so excited. And, um, I still, I mean, there's so much energy in this book because I was so, I was such an, it was such an enthusiastic time of life. And, um, you know, I went to Spain to write it. I was loving life. I was like living out my kind of bohemian artist dream. And then I guess a very literal challenge is I became paralyzed with an autoimmune disease and I could not write for a couple months. Um, and I think... I don't think there was any purpose to that. I think that was a total purposeless, painful experience, but yeah. it was a lesson for me that you can work your whole life for something and it can be taken away, you know? Like I wouldn't have been able to finish that if I hadn't recovered um, about six months later. So that was a really humbling experience and it made me all the more grateful to get it in the world because I don't take that for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, t 
to speak to some of those things where you said like there's just so much mm -hmm. that that part of the challenge was was figuring out how to focus um, what were some things that, that were maybe left on the cutting room floor? Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, like the seven other books I started. <laughs> I, <laughs> there were so many like sad domain names that will never be used because <laughs> I, st I like started new projects. I just wanted to try everything. Um, I was like writing like about fashion. In the meantime, I was really interested in fashion and doing a lot of... Um, Different. I mean, I I started getting opportunities then with um, brands and like famous people. It was such a weird time, such a magical, <laughs> strange time of life. Yeah. And I finally learned that I really had to decline in order to make my work better. And that was a really tough lesson to learn. It's still really hard for me. Um, but I feel like, you know, I'm... I'm not dead, like I have so much more life to live and hopefully those people will still be interested in a few <laughs> years. I don't know how relevant I'm gonna be, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's awesome, that's so wonderful. Um, so do you think there's gonna be a sequel? I mean, I'm hungry for more. Yeah, for sure, yeah, I mean, my uh, something I learned from this book is that I love writing books. I love it. I loved every second of it. So I definitely want to write a second one. Yeah, for sure. Um, I so I think like as someone who um, like has a lot of artist friends, like tries to do art myself, I like personally run into a lot of like moments of doubt where I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I even doing? Like, what what's what's the point of this? Um, and and seeing like people who are so open about like their stories and their experiences and the things that they've learned about themselves and their process is like so inspiring to me. And I'm willing to bet that there's plenty of people in this audience tonight who are inspired by you and, and sort of thinking about their own work. So um, what advice might you have for any people who are trying to sort of ignite the sparks of their life again? Oh, yeah. I mean, again, like I think I was sort of in a fortunate I mean, very unfortunate because I was grieving and depressed, but I was in a creatively fortunate position that I was using creativity for my own survival. And so, especially because I didn't have a goal in mind, I think that's such an important thing that we're not taught. It's like, if you like start a new hobby, I even do this to people I know, and I, I have all people should know better, but you wanna ask like, oh, what are you gonna do with that? Or what are, what's your end goal? You know, oh, do you, be, do you wanna become like a succulent um, Instagram star? <laughs> you know, like, why are you learning about this? Are you gonna be like yeah. a compost queen? Like, right. what is it? And I think like doing something just to enjoy it is such a gift. And this is what I really learned in my illness is like if I had done two years worth of art for the goal of having X amount of followers on Instagram, that would be such a waste, you know? And I, was, I felt very lucky that I could look back and see that as just pure joy and pure love. And of course, like now I do it for a job, it's not always, you know, glamorous and, or enjoyable, but I still don't have like a specific goal with it. I'm mm -hmm. still doing it because it's so ingrained in my identity. It's so a part of my own daily happiness. And if I can just keep doing that, I think, I think people can really tell that authenticity in fellow creators. And so I think where doubt comes in is like, oh, I'm not gonna like make that goal that I set for myself, but like, you know, you, you may not make it for a lot of reasons. And if the goal is just to keep your curiosity alive and your happiness going strong, then you've won. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> amazing. I'm gonna write that down really quick. <laughs> Don't mind me. Um, well, so I just wanted to, to pull up another. Uh, so I, I liked this, this little picture you had towards the end of your Thanks. book. Um, finding yourself equals creating yourself. And here we see Mari sitting at a desk. There's a plate of cookies. Um, one has a bite taken out of it. Um, there's a little cup of tea. And um, there's a drawing that says, I want to be. And it's Mari in a fancy red dress and <laughs> smashing looking heels um, standing in front of the Eiffel Tower. Um, and you 
mentioned in the book uh, that, that, that one of the um, ways that you try to discover yourself and kind of make some of these decisions is um, to impress both your like five-year-old self and your like 90-year-old self. Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking back to um, maybe that kid who was journaling, um, how do you think she would feel? <laughs> sitting in the audience tonight. <laughs> I think she'd be pretty into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even when I was really, really little, the people who I loved the most in the world were like old ladies who wore like feathers in their hair and had like been all over the world and had many lovers. <laughs> I always thought that was the greatest. And I always like, start from when I was 10, I was like, I want as many experiences in life so I can be that with the feathers. Like, I want that. <laughs> and I think, like, more so, I mean, five-year-old Mari doesn't know what Instagram is, but, <laughs> but she does know, like, how many places I've been and, like, how many things I've done and the people I've met. And I'm happy with that. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. That's so nice. Where do you hope to go next? In, in like life? Yeah, or? yeah, I, yeah like, <laughs> like if you're uh, going to be that, that woman with oh the feathers, gosh, yeah. yeah. I, do you have another adventure planned? Well, like physically I'm going to Australia uh, for my next book tour and I'm very excited to be single in Australia. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> I hope to get some stories from that but um <laughs> i i feel like because this was so not expected i feel like i was just born and like i don't know what's coming next and i things i want to do but i feel so open to life and there's so few times of life where you feel that way i haven't felt this way since i was two you know like <laughs> i i feel like i'm learning a new language i'm learning about the world, there's so many things I realized I, I didn't know. And what a like wonderful place to be. It's like I could be surprised by anything. Yeah, absolutely. That, that life full of possibility and cans. Yeah, nice. cool. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm looking at the time here. I think it's, it's just about time for audience Q&A. Aw, oh, I see you. <laughs> <laughs> You can raise your hand and we'll come and find you. Got a question right here in the front. Hey, Mari, thank you so much for coming to SF. Um, I've been a fan for a while, as I'm sure many people in the room are. Um, I had a question kind of following up to when you talked about investing in friendship. So one thing that I've noticed talking to my friends who are also in their 20s, like, oh, yeah, like, I have no idea where to start making friends. Like, there's no, like, it's a really bad example, but Tinder for friends. Like, yeah. if you want to find friends, kind of like, oh, like we met at a bar, we met at a coffee shop, or something like that. So, yeah, you talk about investing in friendships. How do you get to that first step of just like finding people that kind of click with you in a natural, unforced yeah. environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I know. I mean, I I spend a lot of time really getting to know myself, and one thing I really know about myself is that I'm an open book, and I'm very attracted to open books. So when I meet an open book, you know right away. You know, like that, it's just this instant connection. And so those are the people I just like, like you are doing something with me, like we are gonna be friends. That's just something I really, really value because I need people to really go deep with me. I've been through a lot. I. I need to like get there with someone pretty quickly. A lot of people don't need that, but it's something that I need. So when I recognize it, I don't let that go. <laughs> and I find that people who are like that also really appreciate that, you know? And if you have this like very deep well of empathy, I think people can see that and they recognize it in each other. And just, I mean, some of the best friends almost all of the best friends I have, I made in my 20s were people who were going through something at a kind of, um, you know, a hard time that they probably wouldn't share with everyone. But I am so 
excited to share every thought I've ever had right away. And so I think that there was that kind of instant bonding. It was like, let's go through this together. But it's hard. I mean, dance class is fun <laughs> to meet people. <laughs> Events like this, everyone's cute and like happy and sweet. <laughs> Next question on your right. Oh, okay. I thought I wanted to hold it. Um, we could be friends if you want to talk to me after. Um, I was wondering how has your internet popularity affected your life and your relationships? And I guess. Wait, where are you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, how has taking off online affected your relationship with people and the people that you inspire you to make cartoons? Like, are people like, oh, is that about me? And in general, I think as an artist, and I also do cartoons, I think I see someone like you and I'm like, that's the goal. Like, when I get to that point, I'll be happy. And do you see your, like, do you measure yourself in that sense? Or because you weren't headed there, does it not compute that way, I guess? Um, yeah, uh, first question, I... I am really protective of the people in my life, and I don't write about anything, or I don't, I, I write about it, but I don't post about anything until I'm healed from it. And a lot of times that's, that's you know, years later, and I never want people to think that I'm making art or writing out of, you know, a place of gossip or spite, because that threatens my integrity as an artist, and this is how I make my living. So, um, you know, that would not be a good way to go about it, but um, I'm also going to use every relationship I have, and ultimately I think it is for, you know, the good, but I, I try to work from a place of healing first. Um, as far as happiness goes, my happiness is not at all dependent on the internet. <laughs> I think if it were, that would be a really, really hard because I do get a ton of criticism and trolls. And I think that if I were dependent on like praise for my happiness, that would be a really bleak place to be. Um, I, I, I've really tried lately, I mean, I've tried my whole life, but especially lately to kind of diversify my my happiness and my identity into a lot of different things. So when I'm having a really hard internet week, I turn directly to my friends or I turn to um, making travel plans or something that I can rely on that has nothing to do with Instagram. Because I'm also very aware like Instagram is, I mean, you guys would know more than me in, in San Francisco, but that, like Instagram is a fleeting thing. Like, I don't know if it's gonna be here tomorrow and I can't put my entire identity in that or when it dies, I'll die too. So, you know, I've got to keep creating. I also try to create in a lot of other ways. I take dance classes. I try to do music, try to write poetry, like the worst poetry you've ever read in your life. Um, just to like, you know, have other things that I'm doing so that my entire identity isn't like in cartoons. That would be really rough. The next question is up in the back. That being said, <laughs> who are your cartoon inspirations or the current kind of drawings that you're looking at make you happy? Oh, I have so many. I mean, it changes all the time. Um, there's so many really, really good ones out there. I was really lucky very, very early on. I didn't know anything about card. I, I just, this was not a world that was familiar to me at all. I had read Fun Home, which I love, and um, I was familiar with Roz Chast a little bit, but I didn't, uh, there's this great Australian cartoonist, Leuning, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he's great. And, um, and then since joining Instagram, I had so many people really supportive to me right away. My favorite probably always is Liana Fink. She's really, really talented. Uh, Lord Birthday is great. Um, but there's some, I'm learning, you know, new ones every day. It's so, it's such an awesome platform and I, I want people to like be on it. I want people to be making things. It's so fun for me to look at and the way that people can transform like this little square is just incredible <laughs> and really inspiring to me. Next question in the middle right. You are a true inspiration. I wanted to ask you who inspires you? And my second part is um, what is your biggest message you want to tell this audience? today? 
Um, my biggest inspiration is my mom because she is almost 70 and her personality is constantly evolving and it's it's been really really inspiring for me to watch because I think there's this idea that you kind of you get to a certain age whatever age that is and that's like when you stop like you are the person you are and she got married a few years ago she's like she switched jobs she's like taking on all this volunteering she's like watching um YouTube videos to learn how to oil paint. Um, she's like learned Instagram. She reads my comments for me. I don't read them, but she'll like send them to me. And it's just, I mean, it's amazing. Like you're just never set in your one identity, you know, like you're always, always evolving. And I love, love watching that in other people and especially someone so close to me. Um, the one message, I, I mean, I'll, I'll say what I said earlier, like you can also do this and you should also do this. Like if you have a story in you um, that you feel at all compelled to share, it is worth sharing, it is needed. I think, you know, like working from a place of abundance rather than scarcity, there are not enough stories in the world. It seems like there's so many. It seems like there's a story for everyone. There's not your story. And however you can express that, whether it's to f just friends or like in your journal or through like splatter painting or whatever, I don't think there's like, there's enough art in the world. There's certainly not enough authentic art. So if you have it in you, do it. Next question on your right, middle right. Is this me? Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's hard. Um, so I'm constantly impressed by all of the artwork that um, you share with all of us. And something that I pick up on is um, just your ability to convey very deep experiences in such a relatable way, but also um, De through demonstrating it through poise and confidence, and maybe that's this like splashes of color, or um, even like seeing you live tonight is so cool to see you articulate your thoughts in such a like wonderfully strong woman confidence. Um, and so I guess my question is, where do you, uh, when you like look inside yourself at its center, where do you find your confidence? Oh, geez, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I think again, it's like, it is self-knowledge. I think that self-knowledge is your greatest tool in life. And if you know who you are, you're never going to feel like you have to apologize. And I think that it will be, that will be a lifelong journey for me. But I spent so much time feeling like I was doing everything wrong. And that gave me so much time to really learn what worked for me. You know, if I had gotten a job at the New Yorker when I was 20, I wouldn't know myself that well. And I think it was like hitting walls and like um, falling over and just seeing how much I could really take and taking those things that were really difficult for me and finding, I don't think that th difficult things happen to teach you a lesson, but I think you can learn from them. And taking the time to really, really learn from them is what gave me the confidence to not really care what people think about my relationships because I know what I'm doing, you know, like I know who I am and what I want. And so it doesn't really matter to me what strangers say. I mean, sometimes it hurts my feelings, but, it <laughs> but yeah, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. So we have time for one last question. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that Mari will be signing books in the atrium directly after this, so please go buy some copies, support Books Inc., and thank you for coming. And this is our last question. Okay, no pressure. Um, <laughs> first off, I just want to say I lost my dad as well, so I really relate to your grief journey in your book, and props to you for talking about your mom without crying, because my mom's like my person now too, so awesome. Um, I just wanted to know, now that you're kind of like insta-famous and doing all of this art and creating, do you feel daily pressure to make your last post as good as, you know, the first? Or just that pressure to continue to create good art, good 
good words for people. Um, because every time I see Instagram and I see another post from you, I'm like, wow, that's amazing too. <laughs> so I just didn't know if you feel any like societal pressure, like internal pressure to do that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, no, I don't. I feel so lucky. I feel so lucky. I mean, again, like, it's not the biggest part of my identity. And um, I really like doing it. And I think there was, there are some times when I get like I'm, I'm kind of in a good place or a mediocre place or just not really feeling that much. And I'll think, ah, I'm not going through a crisis. Like, what am I gonna write about? But I do have a lot of memories. I do have a lot to draw from. And then I'll like talk about that. Like, I think actually the hardest part for me was when I was um, healing from uh, disease and post-trauma, really. And I was in a really, really bleak place. And it was very hard for me to make art. I was like trying to come up with stuff and, it just, I think that I did feel pressure because that was like as I was writing my book and I felt like oh, I have to like sell books eventually. But what I did is use that like hard time to make art about depression and mental health issues. And then my art became something new. And I think that is the gift of, you know, a really difficult time is that it, forces you to be creative. You have to think about how to do something in a new way. Because if you're doing it the old way, it's not gonna work. I mean, even like for me, um, like dealing with trauma in, in different ways in my life uh, was the feeling that I am a new person now. So the old rules don't apply. And when I was trying to make art with the old rules, it was terrible. But when I made it, actually about the thing I was going through, then I think that it became just a new thing. So as long as I you know, keep it interesting for myself and I don't have any like boss, Insta Instagram boss like <laughs> telling me like this isn't how you make it, then <laughs> whatever. <laughs> cool, well thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much thank for all their so wonderful <laughs> answers. Mari's book is amazing. Go buy it in the lobby, <laughs> say hi, and thank you for coming to the JCC.